Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today we will be playing some Victoria 3. It just came out today. And if I'm being completely honest with you guys, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Or what I'm doing in this game. I never played Victoria 2 or the first game for that matter. I knew about it, about its existence. And uh, I always wanted to like... There's this cool thing you can do with uh, Paradox interactive games where you basically do a grand campaign, they're called, and you start from Crusader Kings and then you just continue with your, the same nation throughout all of their games. So you start with Crusader Kings, then you go to EU4, then I think it would be Victoria, then Hearts of Iron, and then I suppose Stellaris. And I always, that, that was always something that sounded interesting to me and I wanted to do it, but I don't really know how to play Victoria or Hearts of Iron for that matter. So hopefully we can learn today together. There, I see there is a learn the game tab here, so hopefully the tutorial is gonna be okay. I guess I'm gonna pick one of these countries here since they're recommended to learn the game apparently. And it also says here the following game rules are recommended. AI behavior towards players lenient and AI aggression low. I'm not sure if these settings are already set for us or if we have to change them later. Uh, let's see, who shall we be playing as? Well, to stay in theme with our other Crusader Kings uh, series, which if you haven't seen, you should check out. We're gonna play as Sweden, I think. Oh, there we go. We can change the game rules here. So, what did I say? AI behavior towards players. Okay, it's already on lenient and AI aggression is low. I'm assuming... Oh, it can be Iron Man. But I'm not gonna bother with that. Oh, that's interesting. So does that mean that you can earn achievements now in Victoria 3 even though you don't play with Iron Man? Is that what it's saying here? Because that would be pretty cool. But yeah, in any event, so we select Sweden uh, and start game. I have no idea what I'm doing. I know that this game focuses a lot on uh, your economy as a country and uh, I guess it's kind of like a society simulator in a way. So let's see here. Welcome to the age of progress. The year is 1836. Uh, I believe the game runs for about a hundred years if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it has kind of like a similar time progression system as in Hearts of Iron, as in uh, the day is split up between morning and uh, afternoon and etc etc so that's gonna be interesting because I'm more used to the day by day system that they have in EU4 or Crusader Kings. So okay, Carl, Carl? Carl Johan Bernadotte I guess if I butchered that, I'm sorry, is king of Sweden. The industrial revolution is well underway, bringing cataclysmic social change along with it. More than 20 years have passed since the Congress of Vienna imposed some semblance of order upon Europe, and unrest is once again starting to brew among the great powers. It will be up to you to guide Sweden to glory over the following century. Yep, yeah, so hundred years. There is no way to win in Victoria 3. You set your own goals and experience different stories in the process of pursuing them. Yeah, so that's very similar to all of their other games. Let's see. Okay, this is gonna be a lot of reading. Uh, you do not have to learn how everything works before you play. Take it slow and learn from your mistakes and you will soon be an expert policymaker. Well, that's the idea. Let's see. Okay, that's just your basic controls, scroll wheel, yep, yep, yep. By holding tab, you can use an instant overview of the whole world, you can then... Oh, that's cool. That's a feature they could implement in their other games as well. Hopefully I won't forget to use it. Um, okay. Nested tooltips, yeah, uh, I think we're familiar with this from Crusader Kings 3. Yeah, yeah, underline text. Uh, capacities, right, so this is something that works a bit differently than, let's say, EU4, as far as I 
understood. So you don't accumulate these points uh, over time like in U4, you just have like a balance. I'm not exactly sure how to put it, but I think I understand how it works. I'm just not sure how to explain it properly yet, but let's see here. Uh, three capacities measure different aspects of your country's power. Mouse over the orange text to get more information. Okay, so bureaucracy. Okay, so... I kind of get the gist of it, but I suppose I'll have to see it in action to understand. Authority uh, is to affect internal change to your country, like decrees, interest groups, and you gain authority from laws, okay. And influence, I believe, yeah, this is your third diplomatic actions, which makes sense. Okay, uh, capacities originate from some government buildings, certain laws, and your rank. What, it's, what is a rank exactly? Uh, okay, so it's my prestige relative to other countries worldwide. That makes sense. So uh, we are a minor power, which gives us some maneuvers, whatever they are. Can be spent on taking actions, uh, including climbing. Okay, so I'm guessing this is uh, this is a mechanic for war. I think I believe uh, declared interests. Okay, for, okay, let's not worry about it too much for now. Uh, unspent capacity will provide a minor boost to one aspect of your country, while overspending will incur a major penalty. Right. So because we our balance is positive here for authority, for example, uh, let's see. We get I believe it's this minus 25% enactment time and down here I believe yeah it's just it just tells us where do we get all of our authority from and where we are spending it which makes sense okay I'm sorry if the video is too slow or not entertaining for you guys but as I said I'm learning here I hope you learning along with me also you if you have more knowledge about the game than me, then feel free to give me tips and tricks and teach me down in the comments. Uh, for now, this is how we're gonna do it, and hopefully not everything is gonna go above my head, so to speak. So, let's see. Treasury. This is our money. So, okay, so... I believe the balance here, so it says plus 2.9k, that's how much money we're making right now. I, I'm not sure if it's monthly or what, but I believe it's monthly. And we have stored in our bank 501k, so okay. Uh, let's see. Money in the treasury is used to fund the state apparatus. Yeah, makes sense. So we can expand our industry and infrastructure. Fund the state apparatus, pay the military, influence minor nations, okay. The vast majority of money in your country is circulated by buildings. Yep, buildings are very important in this game. And pops, of course, as well. And is outside your direct control. So buildings and pops can be taxed to grow and improve your economy, decrease your expenses by minimizing and the operating costs of government buildings. The balance shown in the top bar reflect a weekly change. Unlike capacities, money can be saved to be spent later, though going into debt by running a negative weekly balance can often wield a better return on investment. Loans will be automatically repaid while your weekly balance is positive. Okay, so loans are more of a passive thing i suppose in this game rather than in eu4 info panels on the left side of the screen a number of buttons can take you to screens yep yep uh, some are used to manage your country uh, okay next oh uh, did it say feel free to look through them okay so we have politics uh this is where we will take care of our government and I have almost no idea what's going on here for now, uh, so yeah, we won't bother with that right now. Our budget, uh, I think we can change our taxes here, and what is this, government wages? Yeah, we can add consumption taxes here, I remember, and uh, yeah, we will see. We also have other stuff here, buildings. Uh, I believe this is gonna be the easiest thing to understand in this game, but maybe I'm wrong. 
Then we have our market, which is a whole can of worms. Uh, I kind of understand the basics of it, but not really. Our military, our diplomacy. Oh yeah, we also have technology trees, right? Uh, then we have cultures, right? We are Swedish. Population. Oh yeah, this is something I like about this game. It breaks down your population very nicely and in a lot of categories. So we have mostly laborers. We have peasants, upkeepers. I believe that's just the three biggest ones. Okay. Yeah, we're mainly Swedish. Very small minorities of other ethnicities. And we are Protestant. Okay. Journal. Uh, I believe this is like your decisions. Or maybe never mind, because there's a tab here called decisions. Like from CK3. Your outliner, right? I remember this. I think you can, yeah, you can like pin this and it will show up here on the right side. And then map list. Okay, so this is kind of like the ledger from EO4, I suppose. Yeah, okay. Next. Along the bottom of the screen are five lenses. These provide easy access to actions you can take to shape your country combined with information needed to make good decisions. Production is for expanding industries to produce, to produce goods and provides details about your economic output. Okay, politics is for managing the government in your population and provides details about power balance in your country. Diplomacy is for initiating or breaking pacts with other countries or starting diplomatic plays against them. It provides details about how other countries perceive you. Military is for expanding your army and navy and recruiting commanders and provides details about wartime matters. Trade lets you expand trade infrastructure and establish trade routes and gives you information about markets okay makes sense open the lens interface by clicking any of the lens buttons okay let's go with this one okay so each lens has its own map mode okay uh, zoom out and take a look at the map to see what details just changed clicking on each lens and looking at the map can give you a good hunch of what's currently going on in your country when you're ready to move on close the lens and press next okay so Let's take a look. Yeah, so... Yeah, this is the diplomatic lens. Makes sense. I like that you see kind of like icons over the countries. To like show what kind of relations you have with them, I guess. Does it say what they mean exactly? Is it just based on attitude? So like, for example... Because Norway is loyal to us, is that why the shield shows up? And then Russia is conciliatory. Well, no, because they both have the same icon and Austria is cooperative. So it must mean something else then. We shall see our military. Yeah, no idea what I'm looking at. So next, trade lens. Okay, so we're part of the Swedish market, which is basically us and Norway. And yeah, okay. Oh yeah. Okay, so these tabs down here don't actually change the map mode. Oh, maybe some of them do. Never mind. I guess only that one then. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Let's move on. Right, you can adjust the speed. Right, we all know this. Uh, timeline spans 100 years. The 1936. Right, right, right. We all know this. So it wants me to unpause even though we did absolutely nothing yet. So sure, we'll go with the tutorial. Okay, now it's telling us about the journal. Uh, okay, it paused for us again. That's good. 
You have just been given your first tutorial challenge. We have paused the game to give you time to read. Remember to unpause. Yep, yep, yep. Open the journal by clicking the highlighted button on the left to begin. We shall do that. Uh, is this different? Uh, this is your journal. All tutorial challenges granted to you can be found here. Other major events in your country may also appear here from time to time. You should inspect the tutorial challenge you have been given. Open the expand a basic building journal entry to continue. Okay, so it's this one here. They want us to expand the livestock ranches in Gotland. Why? Oh, there we go. Uh, I think because I'm hovering over the star, the tooltip goes away. That's a bit annoying. But anyway, so if I click on it, okay, it gives you more details. You have been tasked with expanding a basic agricultural building in one of your states. As you play the game, more tutorial challenges like this one will appear in your journal. You can either try to complete the challenge yourself without any guidance or click the tell me how button for a walkthrough. You can also click the tell me why button <laughs> for more in-depth explanation of why it is important. Okay, I understand. So let's see if we can figure this out. So one way of growing your economy is by constructing or expanding buildings. You cannot always know ahead of time if a certain building will be profitable or not, but expanding a basic agricultural building such as livestock ranches is a relatively safe investment. Okay, so let's see. Let's go to Gotland and buildings. So far so good. There's our livestock ranches. Uh, so they, it has a size of one. I think they just want us to increase it to two, right? Let's do that. Uh, and make sure again. Oh, okay. Apparently we did it. Or oh, it's completion in progress. Okay, it makes sense because the building needs to be built. Um, so we did that, but let's click on tell me why. So, I mean, it makes sense, but it also explains us more game mechanics so a safe way of growing your economy is by expanding a basic resource building that produces a staple good like fabric okay uh, staples are consumed directly by most of your pops who will buy it from the producing building this enriches its workforce who you can tax to earn money for the treasury these funds can be used to expand other parts of your industry okay so build buildings they produce goods, they are then consumed by pops, who will buy it from the building. This makes the workforce bigger, who then I can tax for money, which then I can use the money to expand more buildings, so it's like a vicious circle. We will use your livestock ranches in Gotland as an example. Hover your mouse over the state name Gotland, this will highlight its location somewhere on the map of Sweden. Well, we know where it is, but that's a cool feature. Uh, okay, click on... Oh, okay. So, in the building overview panel, you will see an overview of buildings. They're currently present, yep. Uh, grouped by the four categories, urban, resource, agriculture, and development. Also, I think we can group them more nicely like that. Yep, there we go. I know all these small things, by the way, because uh, I watched some YouTube videos already of Victoria 3, but... It didn't help me understand anything, so here we are. Uh, so, did we read this already? We didn't. In the building overview panel, you will see... No, we did, actually. Never mind, I'm stupid. Uh, look for livestock ranches. Yep, click on them. Okay. So... Under the process section we find the building's weekly balance. A positive balance means the building is profitable and you can see how that profit is allocated in the tooltip. If an industry has a negative weekly balance it loses money, which is generally bad. This will be covered in an upcoming tutorial challenge, okay? So right now we're earning 197 weekly balance, okay, so it goes by a weekly basis. Uh, so, let's see here. So we have 767 revenue and the expenses, I'm guessing, yeah, it's just the wages that we pay our laborers. We don't actually use other uh, goods to produce these ones. 
But what's up with this ownership shares dividends and investment pool? I have no idea. But maybe we're not supposed to know about it yet. <laughs> so we'll just press next. These are the building's expenses. Expenses always include the wages of the building's workforce. It may also include other expenses in money or other currencies such as goods required in the manufacturing process or infrastructure usage levied on its state. Okay, so besides the wages, it's also using one infrastructure. Okay, interesting. Next, these are the building's revenues. Uh, yep, livestock produce fabric as their primary output good, but may also have secondary products. Okay, interesting. Many buildings can produce several different types of goods. Okay, I get it. Produced goods are sold to pops or other buildings at prices that fluctuate depending on market conditions. Right. So it produces some meat as well, and also it gives us urbanization, which is interesting. Okay, next. Buildings do not provide its income to you directly, but provide your pops with jobs and wages. Makes sense. You can see which pops work here under the workforce tab. Okay, so it has 5,000 employees, Jesus. Uh, they're impoverished, as you do. Your average YouTube content creator. Um, let's see. There's a hundred, wait, is that right? Yeah, there's f just 4,000 laborers, so that's the bulk of the employees. Then we have 700 farmers, 200 clergymen? Why do you need clergymen for livestock? Um, but, sure. And then you have aristocrats, 100. One way for you to gain income from this is to tax the employed pops. How much you tax is up to you and can be changed on the budget panel. Right, that's probably gonna piss people off though. Expanding a building such as livestock ranches increases how many pops can work there and enriches the rest of your country's pops by giving them access to fabric at a lower cost than before. Right, so because we're generating more of a certain good, then its price is gonna go down because there's a surplus of it, I guess. Maybe surplus is the is a wrong choice of word, but you get the idea. So, yep, building, workforce, fabric, country pops. I think we also have to be careful though, because we also have to keep in mind like how much population there actually is in Gotland. Because we might not have enough people for, like, who can actually work in those buildings. But it looks like we have over 33k in Gotland, so it should be fine. We also have 1k employed at the port. And another 2.7k employed in some farms. I believe that's if I'm looking at it the right way. But sure, next. Uh, where were we? We were here. But before you go and expand all your buildings, remember that there is a cost to expanding buildings and not all buildings are suitable for expansion. You will learn more about how to identify good candidates for expansion in upcoming tutorial challenges. For now, expanding ag agricultural buildings such as livestock ranches are usually a safe bet. Understood. Kind of. Maybe. So. What if we... Okay, why can't we expand it? Okay, so that apparently that building is not expandable. Well, that answers your question. What if we... I wonder what if we... Increased it by another... Hmm, well, maybe we shouldn't... Try meddling with stuff that they're not telling us to do yet because we might mess something up I unpaused the game uh, we're gonna wait for this to finish it looks like it's gonna take 14 weeks okay we have like a message history here kinda like in Crusader Kings I guess we also have a current situation here also which is 
uh, very reminiscent of Crusader Kings. Uh, but again, it's telling me stuff that I have no idea of what to do with. So I think I will just increase the speed for now and wait for that building. So we can let the tutorial continue. Right, I completely forgot. We actually, as Sweden, we start in a personal union with Norway. Which you can actually also see in the in our flag. There's like a little square there. So, our chat of a king here, Johan, who apparently is French, <laughs> is uh, leading both Sweden and Norway. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, let's see, what about our building? Two more weeks. And there we go. Question mark. Okay, let's pause. We get a notification that it was expanded. The expansion of the livestock ranches in Gotland you ordered some time ago is now complete. The building can now support a larger workforce and produce more goods. You also will no longer have to pay weekly material costs for the goods required in its expansion. Right, so we constantly have to pay for it while it's under construction. I remember that from watching videos. Um, the rate by which you can order the expansion of buildings across Sweden is limited by your construction sector. Right, I also remember something about that. Which can be expanded in exactly the same way as industries. Having construction sector buildings in the same state as the buildings under construction will increase construction efficiency. That was so many times that I had to say construction, Jesus. So, okay, I understand. So, does it want us to increase the construction sector now? Um, wait, let's check our journal, actually. So, change production method. It wants us to change any production method on rye farms in Svealand, I guess, if I pronounced that right. So, rye farms is a building whose earnings could potentially be improved by changing a production method. For the purpose of this lesson, it is recommended that you change a relatively safe production method, such as activating fruit or liquor production on a farm, or the use of tools on a ranch. Okay, so it wants us... It just wants us to change something. Okay, so where are you? You are this province. Okay, let's go to buildings. And you were saying something about rye farms, right? So, okay. So these are the production methods. Um, wait, let's check again. What did it say exactly? So, uh, it is recommended, such as activating fruit or liquor, or the use of tools. Okay. So, how exactly do we do this? Okay, so we can't really change the base here. Um, this is a secondary production method. I don't know if there is a difference there. But uh, apple is a fruit, right? So... Well... I wonder... Okay, so now we're making potatoes, I get it. So we can... right, it was right here. So we can change it either to maintain a single crop, which would mean that this uh, slot here would do nothing and we'd just be stuck with the grain, I suppose. So, what about this? Uh, we can change that. Okay, let's change to apple orchards. Um, what okay right okay so i think we did what it wanted us to do it says completion in progress we just have to wait four weeks but before we do that let's press on tell me why again i can kind of deduce why but let's see what it says production methods determine and change the functions of buildings right for an example of this we will look at the rye farms in svaland uh, i can't can i Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, rye farms. There we go. 
if you hover over any of the active production methods, you can see in the tooltip how many goods that production method consumes and produces. You can also see how many of each profession it needs in the workforce for the rye farms to operate. So, uh, if we hover over the grain, so it generates 60 grain. Again, not sure if... I'm guessing it's weekly. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong though. And uh, it increases employment. Okay, makes sense. I can see down here that it's actually using two tools, which are very fucking expensive right now. And of course the wages and the infrastructure. And we're generating fruit, 20 fruit to be exact, 20 grain and 10 sugar. Okay, that's weird. So why does it say here that we're making 60 grain, but here it says only 20? Uh, oh, well, there you have it. Because in our secondary production method, for our apple orchards, we get plus 20 fruit, but we're actually sacrificing 40 grain. And we also get 10 sugar as well. So that is why. Right, and I think here... You're right, this is basically what it's referring to here. You can also see how many of each profession it needs in the workforce. I believe that's what they mean. And here for harvesting process, we're currently using uh, harvesting tools, which is where these two tools come from, I suppose. And it actually decreases our laborers. Okay, that's interesting. So I suppose the benefit would be that you have less laborers, so you have less wages to pay, but at the same time you have to pay for the tools, which in this moment they are very expensive, so I wonder if it wouldn't be more profitable to actually just switch over to ox-powered plows. So what does it say here if we change it? Predicted impact on weekly balance. Right, so it actually, it would make us a profit. We'd make 42 more uh, pounds or whatever those are. And we would also use less tools, which I believe... Yeah, so it affects the price of tools in the entire market, Swedish market. So because we stop using tools, at least here the total price of tools goes down a bit in the Swedish market because there's not that much demand for it anymore, right? Yeah, though that's those are the systems that I'm gonna have to get used to and uh, wrap my brain around. And we'll also employ a thousand more laborers here. Right, so let's switch over for now, I think. It should be better for us. Now here for ownership we can't really do much, um, not exactly sure what this means either, so let's click next here. So production methods are color coded in different types, okay. Base production methods use a productive workforce made up of pops of different professions to create a product or effect, often consuming one or several goods in the process, okay. There is always at least one base type. Refining production methods reduce the amount of base goods produced to create more advanced or luxurious goods, often by adding other input goods to the process. Automation production methods consume industrial goods, but relieves the building from employing a lot of unskilled workforce. Ownership production methods determine who owns the building and collects its dividends which are available is usually determined by laws, right? So that's this last option here. Okay, next. Uh, if you click on any of the active production methods, you can see that each type includes different production methods, but only one can be active at a time. Some can be considered upgraded versions of previous ones in their type, these often require new technologies to unlock, others are simply alternatives, not inherently better or worse than the others. 
you have to decide what is best for your country based on what goods and professions you have and want. Makes sense. Sometimes upgrading to a more modern production method is not desirable, particularly if the market price of its input goods are very expensive or even in an input goods shortage. Another reason to not modernize right away is because the production method require professions which your pops have poor qualifications for. You might even want to postpone upgrades because the new professions might be prone to political allegiances you are not comfortable with. Right, so there's a lot of things you have to balance and to make decisions upon. Which, I'll be honest, it sounds a bit intimidating. It's a lot of things that you need to keep track of at the same time, it looks like. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just a hard thing to get into at the beginning. But yeah, I think I will leave this episode here for now. And uh, like I said, if you guys are more knowledgeable about this game than me, then please share share it with me so we can make more content with this game in the future. See you guys in the next video.